Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're addressing the various parables of Jesus, which are contained in the Gospels. And this week, the parable of the Great Banquet, found in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Like the parable of the virgins, which we covered last time, this one is framed around a wedding in the Gospel of Matthew, but the same parable is used in Luke as well, with some differences, as we'll see. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a king who made a marriage for his son, and he sent his servants to call them that were invited to the marriage, and they would not come. Matthew 22, 2-3 But he said to him, A certain man made a great supper, and invited many. And he sent his servant at the hour of supper, to say to them that were invited, that they should come, for now all things are ready. Luke 14 16 to 17. It's basically the same parable in both cases, but in Matthew they specifically frame it in the context of a wedding, while in Luke no specifics are provided about this special supper. Also, Luke's telling of the parable doesn't mention that the person involved is a king, which involves some other things being left out later on as well. I'd be very interested in learning whether Luke actually removed the wedding context of the story to make it more understandable to non-Jews, or whether these are actually two different stories, both told by Jesus, with the same basic themes and messages. In any case, we have an image of a person who offers something good to people, something they have a use for. In Matthew, this would be a wedding celebration, a long and joyful experience in ancient Jewish culture, and in Luke, it's a free meal. And they began all at once to make excuse. The first said to him, I have bought a farm, and I must needs go out and see it. I pray thee, hold me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to try them. I pray thee, hold me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Luke 14, 18-20 Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell them that were invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My calves and fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come ye to the marriage. But they neglected, and went their own ways, one to his farm, and another to his merchandise. Matthew 22, 4-5 The people who were invited to come are distracted by other concerns. In Luke's case, this is mostly a lack of courtesy, since there are lots of good reasons for not going to share a meal with someone. Things come up sometimes. In Matthew, however, we're dealing with a king holding a wedding for his son. Everyone in the kingdom should consider this important. Royal weddings don't happen every day, and the king actually went to the trouble of inviting them. The farmer should be able to attend, even if it means having work to make up when he gets back, while the merchant would actually be able to use a royal wedding to network with important people. However, each of them is only concerned with the normal grind of work that they usually do, and they can't see that there are bigger things going on here. And the rest laid hands on his servants, and having treated them contumeliously, put them to death. But when the king had heard of it, he was angry, and sending his armies, he destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. Matthew 22, 6-7 This section is only in Matthew's telling of the tale, since it only makes sense if the person inviting guests is important. Here, some of the people who were invited attack and kill the messengers. This is a reference to the way the prophets of Israel were killed by the people of Israel in the past, despite offering them a better way forward over and over again. In a larger sense, this also applies to everyone who responds violently or censoriously to being told a truth they don't want to hear. Matthew says that God will punish them with his armies, most likely either angels or human beings doing the will of God with or without realizing it, in the same way the Persians liberated the Israelites from slavery in Babylon. Then he saith to his servants, The marriage indeed is ready, but they that were invited were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, call to the marriage. And his servants, going forth into the ways, gathered together all that they found, both bad and good, and the marriage was filled with guests. Matthew 22, 8-10 And the servants returning told these things to his lord. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the feeble, and the blind, and the lame. Luke 14.21 The best and the brightest refuse to come, so he invites everyone else instead. 
In Luke, this means people who had injuries or were poor, which was much more taboo in those days, since many people saw injuries, illnesses, and misfortune as a sign that someone had fallen out of favor with God. In fact, the entire book of Job is about this misconception. In Matthew, the king recognizes that people's unwillingness to attend his son's wedding proves they're not worthy to do so, so he sends them out into the highways to look for people. Now, this is pretty significant since Matthew was written mainly to be read by the Jews, and so it would have been seen through a first century Jewish lens. The highways being referred to were the road system built and protected by the Roman Empire. And while you'd find some members of the Jewish people on those roads, you'd also find people who were travelers from far away, who the Jews generally saw as inferior, as well as people whose business took them outside of Jerusalem for long periods, and who were therefore seen as ruffians by the people of Jerusalem. Shepherds, for example. Also, roads in general were known to have lots of people traveling on them and carrying sometimes valuable goods on them, so that attracted both beggars and bandits. It's not hard to see why Matthew should specify that some of the people invited to the prince's wedding were not good people. However, it's also possible that someone who felt they needed to resort to robbery in the past might be overjoyed at being invited by a king to be his guest at his son's wedding, and accept, seeing it as his big break. In this case, he's not wrong, since the wedding that God invites us to is the marriage of Jesus and his church in heaven, the biggest break there is. And the servants said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. But I say unto you, that none of those men that were invited shall taste of my supper. Luke 14, 22-24 Again, a reference to the highways, and this time to hedges as well, implying places where bandits would be likely to hide as they waited for victims to approach. What this parable is saying is that even the worst criminals will have an easier time getting into heaven than people who were offered a chance to do so and turned it down. And the king went in to see the guests, and he saw there a man who had not on a wedding garment. And he saith to him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? but he was silent. Then the king said to the waiters, Bind his hands and feet, and cast him into the exterior darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 22, 11-14 Again, Matthew trusts that the people reading this will understand the context of a royal wedding in Jewish culture. In today's society, we might think it's harsh, as well as absurd, for a king to invite bums off the street to his wedding, then tie them up and throw them out the door for being dressed like street bums. However, royal weddings in ancient cultures were different. In the kind of wedding being referred to, it was expected that each guest would dress in clothing appropriate to the occasion, and because most people wouldn't have the money to pay for such fancy clothes, it was customary in most cases for the king to provide them himself. In other words, this guest at the wedding arrived, was given a magnificent outfit by the king, then deliberately tried to attend the party without putting it on. This is why the guest doesn't try to defend himself when the king asks him why he's still dressed in his street clothes. In the context of this parable, I've sometimes heard it said that this refers to accepting the gifts of the sacraments to purify us of serious sin and keep us in a state of sanctifying grace, and that's certainly one way to interpret it. In any case, it definitely refers to people accepting the overall invitation of God, but not being willing to accept some particular part of that invitation, which is well within their power to accept. For instance, it could refer to a person who claims to love God, but refuses to honor some of the commandments of God. There are many things that this part of the parable probably refers to. In any case, the context of ancient Jewish culture can shed some light on some of the more confusing aspects of this parable while expanding on the parts that are more clear already. The overall message is that God offers us a great opportunity, and we should accept it fully, embracing his path to salvation for ourselves, not refuse to cooperate or always hold back out of stubbornness. Next, the rich man. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.